Chapter 25, The Reel of Misfortune. The world smells different after a storm. We have no power or phones the next morning, and that has Grammy worrying she'll miss the game show network for days on end. I admit you to get out and find Ronan, but Grammy won't let me go. She's worried about power lines being down. But I have to go find Ronan and see if he's okay. Grammy smiles big, and I am annoyed. Until she looks past me, waves her hand, and Ronan steps inside. Before I think about it, I give him a quick hug. He doesn't know it's because I'm happy he's alive. He straightens and looks at me like I just coughed up a quay hog. Hey, Delcy. His face is red. Sorry, I'm, I'm just so happy you're okay. Why would I not be okay? I heard you were in the water during that storm and your father had to go in after you. Is that true? Heck no, but my father did go in after some other kid who drifted out on his inner tube and couldn't make it back in. I didn't see it, but it was pretty hairy, I guess. The kid's mother cried all over my dad, and now they're calling him Gusty Gale instead of Gut. Oh, I'm sorry, Gutsy Gale instead of Gusty, which he hates. I mean, hates. I can see how Ronan feels about it. That's cool. You must be proud, huh? Yeah, yeah, I am, he laughs, but don't tell him I told you. You'd think he robbed a bank the way he wants to keep it a secret. I laugh. Okay, I won't. Man, but that storm was wild, huh? Freaky. Wild, yeah, I loved it. Most people would take a sunny day, you know. You're kind of alone on this. I've always loved wild weather. When I was little, I used to like watching the wind out the window, pushing things around the yard. It seemed like magic for things to just swirl around by themselves. And my papa loved weather, too. We put up our own weather station, and we'd go out every morning to check it. He got me lots of weather books, too, so I could read about what makes the wind and stuff. Yeah, he says, so what causes wind then? Air, <clears throat> air moving in and out of different pressures. But all the while, the earth rotates underneath, so the wind gets pushed around. I used to wonder if the wind would get annoyed by that. Yeah, the wind gets mad. That's when you get a hurricane. Funny, Ronan, but no. You need really low barometric pressure for that. Yeah, the wind gets mad. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, he rolls his eyes. Of course you do. Then he shakes his head. But it's pretty cool how smart you are, Delcy. Thanks for noticing, I says. So, he says, have you been down the other end of the beach? There's something kind of cool. You want to see it? I nod. After Ronan assures Grammy that there are no power lines down near us, we jog towards Seagull Beach. As we run through puddles, water splashes all around us like it's raining up from the ground. Everything but the tops of our heads is soaked when we get there. There is a small crowd of people and a boat. See, Ronan says, an abandoned boat, since you're into that kind of thing. What do you mean? Well, don't you take pictures all over the place of things left around, towels and stuff? He's noticed that? I'm embarrassed. That is until I recognize the boat. It's the only multicolored fishing boat that's ever pulled up to Chatham Pier. <gasps> oh no, I yell. That's Henry's boat. What? Ronan looks at the boat again. He looks worried. Henry, I yelled. What happened to Henry? Well, he can't be on the boat with it's on its side like that, right? We both look toward the ocean. He wasn't answering his phone yesterday, and I haven't seen him today. I start to run, not toward the boat, but toward Henry's house, and Ronan is right on my heels. I jump up onto Henry's porch and hang and bang on the door several times, wait, and bang some more. Finally, I yell, Henry, are you home? Henry, no answer. I lean my forehead against the door. We should call the police, Ronan says, or the Coast Guard. They would have done that on the beach already, but I have a place we can check. Where, Ronan asks, but I am already running. Saucepan Lens, I say. It's his favorite place to eat breakfast. With Ronan on my heels, I run through several backyards and down Old Wharf Road to a tiny cafe behind the post office where the locals eat. The creaky door slams as we walk in and the regulars at the counter all turn to look at us. Henry, I yell, you're alive. He laughs. Was I dead? The bacon hasn't gotten me yet. I couldn't find you and I know Esme and Ruby aren't home. Well, Ruby and her mom are away for a couple of days, and I didn't realize they'd been hiding anywhere. He smiles as he takes another bite of scrambled eggs. I want to hug. I want to hug him, but I guess I need to stop hugging people and telling them I'm glad they're not dead. Sit down with me and have some breakfast, Henry. I say we can't now. The real fortune has been beached. What? It's down on Seagull Beach. He's wide-eyed and stops chewing to ask. 
Are you sure? Henry, I say. It was Papa Joseph's boat. I know what it looks like. Henry stands and fumbles with his wallet and throws some money on the counter. Let's go, he says, stepping over a dog and heading for the door. Henry's truck slides on the sand as he pulls into the parking space and slams on the brakes. He's out and running before we are. When he sees the boat, he stands with both hands on top of his head. Captain Ahab, he yells. Here, Captain Ahab, come here, boy. Ronan leans closer. He didn't tell me he was nuts, he says. I knock Ronan with my shoulder and point at Henry, who's scooping up a cat with three white legs and one black one. Captain Ahab must be the only cat in the world who loves the water. He's one of the reasons I've spent hours trying to talk to Grammy into getting me a kitten. On long fishing days, Captain Ahab is someone to talk to. Henry took him home once, but he yowled the entire night. Henry figures the cat, that cat doesn't know it should be terrified of the ocean and maybe just loves the smell of striped bass. I am matey. Henry sounds like a pirate as he talks to the captain. Have you run our boat aground in search of your favorite fish? Then he puts the cat down on the sand. And while the cat does figure eights around his ankles, Henry lets out a sound like a giant with a toothache. He rakes his own hair with his fingers and looks to the sky. Well, boats aren't meant for beaches, so let's work on getting her back in the water. Ronan steps forward. We can wait until the tide comes in and push her back to sea. Well, Ronan, that's the right idea, but we'll need a bunch of help. If we try to move it ourselves and get an unexpected surge, someone could end up a permanent part of my boat, Henry says, chuckling. When times are toughest, he finds reasons to laugh. He takes out his phone and moves a few steps away while he talks. So, Ronan begins, that was your grandpa's boat? Yeah, the reel of fortune for fishing. And because Grammy loves game shows. Huh, that's funny. Why is it all different colors? Papa Joseph painted a different color every year, knowing that it would chip and reveal different colors underneath. He said it was a good reminder that everyone carries a lot of history with them. He thought chips and dents made a person more interesting. I expect Ronan to give me some wise guy answer, but instead he looks me in the eye and says, I wish I'd met your papa. Henry returned, so I've got some lads with boats coming. We'll get the rail back in the water. Henry puts his hand on Ronan's shoulder, but as Ronan points out, we'll have to wait until the tide comes in. Ronan stands taller. Yep, Henry says, we'll just wait for nature. She put us in this predicament and will help get us out. No use shouting at the rain. No one was hurt. He reaches over and rubs my back. The reel is tipped on the beach here, but I don't see any damage. And Captain Ahab is here to live another day of the eight lives he's got left. Chapter 26, A Bit of Drama. Ron and I are talking about our strategies when it comes to Monopoly. We both believe in buying everything you can, but I leave the utilities behind because you can't build houses and hotels on them, and I like to build houses and hotels. Lots of them. Delcy, I hear a familiar voice I've missed. It's Amy, and Michael's with her. They're coming up the driveway. Who are they again, Ronan asks. Amy and Michael, my friends who were in the Cape Playhouse play this summer. Oh, he says, biting his nail. I jump up and run to them, giving them both hugs. It feels good to have my old friends back. What are you doing here? Amy is staring at Ronan and then looking at me. I know her well enough to understand she is questioning why he is here. After that day of watching him at Sunday school. Are you the kid from Sunday school, Michael asks. From Sunday school? I don't live there, if that's what you mean. No, of course not. You were there that day. Ronan gets squinty-eyed in a nervous kind of way. What day? I interrupt. We were all there one day when you were, but we didn't really know you yet. We only knew that you and your dad had just moved here. Oh, so what are you two doing? Amy asks. Playing Monopoly. The real version or your homemade one? Why would I buy one if I have one? I, I ask. Oh, no, I get it, she says. Not enough money and with houses and hotels that fall over, I think it's perfect. And she gives me a shove and a look only a friend who's known you forever could give you. She knows my mom made that game and I will never get rid of it. So, Amy continues, do you want to hit Capable? Playhouse gave us a ton of tokens for the machines and free bowling game coupons. I think it's so the kids who don't live here can check things out, but we got some too. I mean, we don't have any money, I say. Amy shoves me a bit. I know, I told you, we've got tons. So we all head up to Cape Bowl, where there's an arcade, a bowling alley, and a snack bar. 
Michael swings open the door and lets us all walk in ahead of him. We decide to bowl first. When we get to the counter to get shoes, Ronan hangs back. I don't need any shoes. I'll just wear mine. You can't, I tell him. You have to get shoes. He looks down at his feet. He looks down at my feet. Are you getting shoes? I reach into my pocket and pull out some ankle socks. For bowling? Yeah, you have to have special shoes. Special shoes is an ugly shoes. Why can't I just wear mine? You stumble if you wear yours. The bowling shoes slide. Ronan looks a lot happier. Slide? Cool. We all get shoes and Ronan stares down at his feet like he's grown an extra toe. But then he takes a running start and slides down the lane about six feet. I go first, and Ronan watches everything I do. I get seven pins, but Amy claps like I hit 11. While Michael is walking over to pick up a ball, Amy starts to yell, Brandy, over here. Then she turns to me. Look, Dells, Brandy is here. I turn slowly, not happy about who I'm going to see. I haven't had a chance to tell Amy about the situation with Brandy and Tressa, and now they're heading our way. Turns out they are assigned to the lane next to us. Oh, how did I get so unlucky? Hey, I say. Brady seems unhappy to be next to us, but says hi back. They begin to put on their shoes. Okay, Ronan says, how hard could it be? Just stick your fingers in three holes and throw the ball at the pins. Well, you roll it, not throw it, I say. Tressa laughs, and I'm thankful I don't have to see her much. Ronan takes a running start and swings the ball out in front of him, but doesn't let go. He flies into the air and lands in the lane with a loud thud. Everyone turns. <clears throat> Brandy and Tressa laugh. Michael and Amy laugh, too, actually. I mean, when I see he isn't really hurt, it's hard not to laugh. I've never seen anyone launch themselves down a lane before. Are you okay, Ronan? Yeah, you think you're a human bowling ball or what, Tressa asks. Be quiet, I say. I wonder if Ronan is going to get mad. Michael stands and reaches out a hand to help Ronan. Amy comes over and whispers, What is going on with Brandy? She went to the dark side, following that other one. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, tell me about it. I turn to Ronan. Do you want to play video games? No, why would I want to do that? I'm just getting the hang of it. Oh, yeah, I actually thought you might be um, embarrassed. You didn't like my first turn? What's wrong with it? He raises his eyebrows, trying to look innocent. Oh, it was great. A few more feet and you could have hit the pins with your head. Excuse me, with your head. The four of us laugh. Takes running four turns at two pins. He sounds like he bowls like I do. And he jumps around like he got a perfect game, pumping his fist, spinning around. This kid is a goof, Michael says. He kind of grows on you, though. Like mold grows on old food, Tressa chimes in. I glare. Who asked you? <gasps> oh, did we hurt your his feelings, Tressa asks. I turn to Brandy, who acts like she's not paying any attention to us. Do you even speak anymore, or are you not allowed? <clears throat> Be Quiet, Delcy. Oh, clever comeback, I say. Ronan steps forward and stands closer to Tressa and Brandy. I've learned a lot this summer. One thing is that when you're hurt, it means you care. So here's a question for you. If I'm not hurt, what does that mean? Come on, Tressa said to Brandy. Let's go get snacks. I know that watching Brandy walk away will stick with me for a long time. I'll miss the friend she was and could have been. But as Ronan makes Michael and Amy laugh behind me, I think about how loyal these three are. I guess some friends are just glitter, and some friends are glue. Chapter 27, Whatever Floats Your Boat. There's a knock on the door. I can tell it's Henry, just by how much the screen door rattles. Hey, Delcy, how are you? Good. I'll get Grammy. No, actually, I'm here to talk with you. You are? Yeah, he says, folding his arms. What's the weather like, look like tomorrow? 82 degrees, moderately humidity, decent barometric pressure, which is good. Winds out of the east at only about six miles per hour. A quiet day, I say. But I know you knew that, so what gives? Well, I didn't know quite that much, he laughs. I just wanted to hear you say it. I knew you'd have the report. He unfolds his arms and stuffs his hands in his pockets. 
So it sounds like a pretty perfect fishing day. No wind, no weather, no surprises, which I know you'll like. I'm so excited. I know what he's going to ask. So I'm wondering if you'd like to come out with me. You're older now and I think it's about time. Are you up for it? I jump once. I would love it. I clap my hands together as if to pray. But I told Ronan I'd hang out with him. Can he come with us, please, please, please? Fine with me, provided his dad says it's okay. I hug Henry and he laughs again. Then he leans through the doorway and yells, Bridget, did you hear that? Can I take your girl fishing tomorrow? Grammy appears in the doorway. How's the weather, Henry? It's going to be as quiet as a seal on Monomoy Island. Okay, Henry, but you take good care of my girl, you hear? You know I'll take care of her just like she's mine. I smile at Henry and leave for seaside heaven. Ronan's drinking orange juice when he opens his door. Hey, he says between gulps. Henry Lasco says he'll take us both fishing tomorrow if your dad says it's okay. Before he can say anything, his father calls. Ronan, who's at the door? It's just Delcy. Just Delcy? It's no way to greet someone, Ronan. His father steps up to me. His hair is a mess and his face is scruffy, covered in whiskers. He smells like bacon. He waves me in. The house is dark and there are clothes all over the backs of the chairs. There are some wooden fish hanging on the wall and a poster of a Portugal map over the couch. Ronan seems uneasy. So what brings you by, Delcy? his dad asks. Henry, my neighbor, wants to take me and Ronan out on his boat fishing tomorrow, but he says he'll have to give permission. Who is this Henry guy, and how big is the boat, and does he have experience on the water? He's a striper fisherman out of Chatham. He's kind of like my dad, I tell him. I don't know exactly how big his boat is, but it could probably hold, like, five couches. He laughs. A practical girl. I like that. He turns to Ronan. Is this the boat you found beach that day? Ronan nods. Well, he says, leave me this Henry's number and I'll give him a call. Really, Ronan asks? You have to call? Hey, I don't know the guy. I want to feel him out. I wouldn't loan my car to a stranger. You think I'd send off my son out on the ocean, no less? <clears throat> I'm glad he pretty much said yes, Ronan tells me, but now all of a sudden he's looking worried. What's wrong, I ask. I don't have stuff to go fishing. I don't have a pole. I don't have clothes for it. You know, I don't even have a bathing suit. I don't think it matters. If you wear jeans and long sleeves on a boat, you'll look just like Henry and most of the other fishermen. And me. I, bur I burst into flames if I'm out in the sun all day. It's called an Irish tan. We bring fire extinguishers to the beach. He rolls his eyes. Okay, I get the point. I shove him a bit, and Henry has stuff for us to fish with. Come on, it'll be fun. If you don't say yes, I'll have to invite Tressa and Brandy. Okay, okay. God, I can't let you bring a couple of sharks to a fishing party. Chapter 28, Shark Snack. Oh gosh, this is too long. Alright, I'm bad. When Henry, when Henry and I pull in to pick up Ronan, it's still dark outside. Well, hello there, Ronan. Glad to have you aboard. Sorry about the time. Gotta go and the tides are just right. Thanks for inviting me. For a long time, we drive in silence on empty dark roads until Henry finally says, So, Ronan, you said your dad had a lot of experience on the water. Perhaps you'll take to it, too. He did. He was a swordfish fisherman before I came. He'd be out for weeks at a time. Henry heads up the hill toward Chatham Pier. That's a tough life. Takes a lot of guts. Yeah, Ronan says he misses it. He says that a lot. I think he wants to go back to it. Henry stares at <coughs> Ronan as he pulls the key out of the ignition. I think he's going to say something, but instead he pushes open his truck door and we all get out. Then he reaches into the back and pulls out two life vests. Put these on. I don't need that, I say. <coughs> I don't like those things. Well, you don't have to wear it then. You'll be more comfortable, I'm sure. Huh, that was easy, I think. I mean, he continues, you'll be sitting on the dock waving to Ronan and me as we head out to sea, but you'll definitely be more comfortable. <sighs> I take the vest and put it on while Ronan's laughing. When Henry starts the reel, I feel a jolt and rumbling through my feet. I look at the captain's wheel and half expect to see Papa Joseph wearing his hat with the flaps on the sides and back to shield him from the sun. His t-shirt has a salty fisherman on the back that said, call me Joseph. It isn't long before we head around the Monomoy. Ronan points. Hey, look at all the seals. Yeah, Henry says. 
Monomoy is one of the best restaurants on the Cape for Great Whites. No reservations required. Cool, Ronan lights up. Maybe we'll see Great Whites. I love Great Whites. That's because you're not a seal, I say, watching the seals lie on the sand. I wonder if the Madre and her baby are there somewhere. <clears throat> when we hit the open ocean, Henry turns on his GPS and fish finder. I'm surprised at how detailed they are, like watching a TV screen. Ronan leans in and studies it. Look, Delcy, look at the fish there. Not quite the ones we're looking for, Henry sighs. Probably a big school of mackerel. If I were looking for bait today, that would be great, but we want to nab bigger stuff. How can you tell what kind of fish it is? Ah, the size, the depth, and the depth in terms of the sun, too. As the sun gets higher in the sky, the stripers go deeper. That's why we're out here so early. In the distance, a bunch of seagulls are dive-bombing the surface of the water, a sure sign that there are fish there. As we get closer, we see there are rips. When we get to the spot, the birds are angry, but Henry is happy. We're right over a shoal, and I think we're looking at some stripers here on the screen. Let's get fishing and see if we can get them into the boat. Henry flaps open a plastic box. Inside, there are live eels. I remember they are his favorite bait for catching stripers. Ronan reaches in and picks one up. Good, not squeamish. Good way to begin. I plunge my hand into the box and grab an eel too, a bigger one than Ronan's. It's going to be a lucky day. I can feel it, Henry says. So you two want to bait your own hooks? <clears throat> I hesitate since the eel's looking at me. But I think of my mama, and I want to be at least as good as her at this, even better. Yes, I can do it. Just show me how. Henry grabs an eel and puts the hook through one eye and out the other so it holds. He then holds up the eel, which makes the letter J, telling him it's still alive. Yep, good solid hold there, he says. The striper will attack its prey from the front, so the hook will have a good chance of catching the striper that way. Ronan baits his hook. So do I, and it's gross, but I don't let on. Good things come to those who bait, Henry says, unless you're an eel, I say. So, now I cast? Nay, no casting for stripers. You just drop it in the water off the side and then jig it, move it up and down. Here, fishy, fishy, I say. Henry shakes his head. Okay, he says, if you feel like you've got a nibble, count to three slowly and then yank the line. If you yank too soon, you'll probably pull the hook out of the fish's mouth. You've got to be patient. As it turns out that being patient is important as we sit for over an hour with no nibble from anything. We can't make a lot of noise either because Henry says that scares off the fish. But finally, finally, I get a nibble and I count to three. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, and yank. Great, Delcy, <clears throat> you set the hook. I think Henry is happier than I am. But the fish isn't. It yanks back hard and we see it come out of the water curling as it fights back. Let me help you, Delcy, Henry says. No, I'm going to do it myself. Oh boy, he laughs. I hear your mom say that to your pop. I heard your mom say that to your papa many times. I'm both happy and sad to hear this. With Henry's directions, I pull the pole back behind my head and then crank the reel, moving the pole forward, never letting the line get slack. Move back, crank the reel, move pole in front of me. Pull back and repeat. By the time Henry plunges the net into the water to scoop up the fish, my arms are so tired. I can hardly lift them. <clears throat> but I did it myself. I caught my own fish, and I wish Grammy and Esme had been here to see it. We measure it, and Henry says, Whoa, a 40-incher. You start off small, that's for sure. I'm guessing about 23 pounds. And about $3 a pound, you just earned about $70. Wait, what? I get to keep the money? You get to keep whatever we sell it at. That's a good estimate. I jump up. Yes! Henry hoists the fish into the huge cooler, cooler filled with ice. Ronan is happy for me, I can tell, but I can also tell he really wants his own fish. Henry puts his hand on Ronan's shoulder. All right, son, just pull out the big guns. My lucky St. Croix, one of the best fishing poles around. I turn around. St. Croix, isn't that where Esme was born? Indeed, a unique, beautiful island, smart, beautiful lady. Henry offers help Ronan, but he wants to do it himself. With the first nibble, Ronan yanks too quickly and loses the fish. <clears throat> Happens to the best of us, Henry says. Later, I catch another striper that's only 30 inches long. Henry says we have to throw it back. It's too small to keep. Ronan gets another bite. He counts to three and then yanks his pole to the side, setting the hook in the fish's mouth. When the fish breaks the surface, we see it's an enormous one. 
and Ronan breaks into the biggest smile I've ever seen on him. Now, when you get this one in the boat, the sucker will be a great picture for your dad. Ronan looks sad, but brightens to agree. I can tell he's faking. Henry stands behind him with a slight smile and the ocean reflecting all of his glasses. I feel thankful for him. Thankful that he took us out and thankful just to know him. Ronan is cranking the reel on the St. Croix, pulling back, cranking again, pulling back. Well, Delcy, I think this may be as big as yours, but it's hard to hold on to the pole. Man, this thing is heavy. $70 worth of heavy, I say, smiling. We'll go to saucepan lens and have all the pancakes we can eat. As Ronan laughs, his pole is yanked hard. A great white shark comes out of the water like a rocket off a launch pad. It comes up from underneath the fish with its mouth wide open, soars upward, nabs the fish, and then falls back into the ocean almost on its side. It all happens so fast that it takes me a few seconds to realize Ronan has let go of Henry's prized St. Croix fishing pole. It's about 10 feet from the boat and moving away from us. Ronan takes two running steps toward the side of the boat, ready to jump over, I think, but Henry is about to grab a hold of his life jacket and pull him back. Henry is, wi is wide-eyed, looking at him. What are you doing, Ronan? It's just a fishing pole. I can cut the line, he says. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. I'll help the shark. Get the St. Croix back for you. He won't be interested in me. Great whites don't attack people. Very rarely, I'm more likely to get killed by a vending machine or a cow. More cows attack people than sharks, and no one freaks out about them. What? <clears throat> Henry is confused. It's a shark, a great white. Seriously, statistically, it's more likely I'd get killed by a vending machine or a cow than a shark. Listen, kid, you really... Please, Ronan interrupts. I've never heard him sound like that before, like a little kid begging. You can't do that, son. You saw that shark who took your fish. He's still around somewhere. I could be fast. I'll cut the line and grab it quick. Looking out at the water, I notice the pole is gone now. I think it's too late anyway, Ronan. Ronan's face is hard like a rock. I'm sorry you lost the fish. I'll split my money with you. But your pole, the St. Croix is your lucky one. I'm so sorry. I want to get it back for you, he begs Henry. It's just a pole, Henry says, stepping forward. It's okay. <clears throat> it's okay. And Ronan steps back. I didn't mean to let it go. If I, it's really okay, Ronan. Relax. It wasn't all that lucky anyway. Henry reaches out to touch his shoulder, but Ronan leans just enough away to avoid it. Things happen, Henry says. Better the pole go into the water than one of you. I'm so sorry, Ronan repeats. He sits down on the deck with his back against the side. His knees are up near his chest and his forehead rests against his palms. Then he looks up to say one more thing to Henry. Please don't tell my father. What kind of fisherman would want me for his kid?